Boy, you all quieted down so nicely. <laughs> Good evening to all of you and welcome to tonight's Trinity Forum conversation featuring Oz Guinness speaking on the ideas in his new book, Last Call for Liberty, How America's Genius for Freedom Has Become Its Greatest Threat. I'm Sheree Harder, the president of the Trinity Forum, and on behalf of all of us involved in the Trinity Forum, we are so delighted that you're here. Uh, we're also grateful to the anonymous yet very generous donor who made tonight's uh, event possible. And we're, we know that it's been hard to find a space. If there's any of you who are still looking, uh, perhaps to no avail for a place to sit, there is plenty of seating up on the balcony. If you just walk out the doors, we have a whole army of interns who are eager to take you to the elevators to find a comfortable and spare seat in the balcony. So do avail yourself of that opportunity. I'd also like to welcome just a few special guests who are here tonight with us. We have two trustees who've come in from out of state and we're really delighted to have them here. Mike Brennan who came in from Columbia, South Carolina and George Clark and from Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. We know there are a large number of people here tonight who were involved with the very founding of the Trinity Forum. I won't call you all by name, but just wanted to give a shout out. Thank you for coming back and welcome uh, to tonight. We also have a large contingent from North Carolina. So if you are from North Carolina and have come in for this event, raise your hand. We're so glad to have you here. <laughs> Definitely worthwhile. We've been really delighted by the enthusiasm for tonight's event, and we know that there are many people who wanted to be here tonight and could not get in for one reason or the other. So if you are friends with those folks and have been talking with them, let them know that they can follow along via live stream, which is going on even as we speak, uh, which they can access either by the Trinity Forum's YouTube page or our Facebook page. Uh, Page. They have their choice of social media there. Uh, we'll also be posting video within the next couple days, and I believe C-SPAN is covering as well, which we're delighted by. We will have photos on our Facebook page, so tune in tomorrow, tag your friends, add your comments. And those of you who cannot tear yourself away from your Twitter feed, uh, we, will, we do have two different hashtags going on at uh, hashtag TTF tonight and hashtag last call for liberty. So feel free to add your comments and opinions there. I also know there's a number of people where tonight is their first Trinity Forum event. So if that describes you and you're not familiar with the Trinity Forum, a little bit of background about us. We exist to provide a space and resources for the discussion of life's greatest questions in the context of faith. And we do this both by providing readings and publications which draw upon classic works of literature and letters that explore the enduring questions of life and connect the timeless wisdom of the humanities with the timely issues of the day, as well as programs such as this one tonight, which connects leading thinkers with thinking leaders and engaging those big questions of life and ultimately coming to better know the author of the answers. Obviously, one of the great questions of life is how to order a just and free society, and how such a system of ordered liberty can be sustained, protected, and transmitted to a new generation. It's a question that has occupied our speaker tonight for many decades and been a focus of his life's work. And it's a question that seems particularly urgent and even poignant at a time when authoritarianism is on the rise around the world when a consensus about what freedom is and requires is rapidly eroding, when the civic and relational bonds that have connected citizens across differences are rapidly dissolving, when the character traits and habits that were historically understood to sustain and preserve freedom are dismissed as pretentious or obstacles to action, and when efforts to divide, antagonize, confuse or demonize seem to be rewarded with clicks, likes, retweets, votes, funding, or celebrity status. In his new work, Last Call for Liberty, Liberty, for which this evening also serves as his national book launch, our speaker tonight will argue that there are two rival and irreconcilable ideas of freedom that are increasingly pulling our country apart, and they are headed for a showdown. 
He argues that in the midst of our growing political polarization, personal isolation, and tribalism, in his words, quote, the deepest division is rooted in the differences between two world-changing and opposing revolutions, the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789 and their rival views of freedom and the American experiment. Understanding the differences between these warring views of human freedom is vital as a necessary first step towards valuing, safeguarding, and transmitting a freedom that not only saves us from despotism, but offers a common vision for the common good and for human flourishing. It is, by any measure, a fascinating and provocative argument. And there are few who can make it with the eloquence, energy, or expertise, much less the elegant English accent, <laughs> as our speaker tonight, Oz Guinness. <laughs> oh, one sec. Just a few more words. Thank you, Cherie. It's a real honor and a delight to be back in the Trinity Forum. I speak, as most of you know, as an Englishman and so as a visitor to this country, but a very strong admirer. But I speak tonight out of a deep concern as I watch your country at the present moment. It's often been said that there are times when history and human decisions meet at a single point to cast the die of a nation's fortunes. It was like that for Rome when Caesar crossed the Rubicon. It was like that for England when Sir Francis Drake sailed out to face the Armada. It was like that for you when the first shots were fired at Lexington and Concord. Others would argue that it's the accumulated consequences of many decades that really shape the course of a nation. And one could argue that today. I'm not sure which side to take. But as I look at this country, I believe America is suffering its gravest crisis since the Civil War, and is as deeply divided as at any time since just before the Civil War. And all this at a moment when we can see the challenges globally. Our Western world in evident decline. The search for a new world order faltering. And now people are talking the global tinderbox. The world agenda overwhelmed with problems, some of them unprecedented. And as we look towards the future, we see what C.S. Lewis called the master generation. The generation through genetic engineering and social engineering could have put a stamp on the whole human future without the consent of the future generations through, as we're now discussing it, singularity, transhumanism, and so on. And at this very moment for the world, America so deeply divided. But what is the deepest cause of the division, and why does it matter? As you know, we have many suggested explanations. Another round of left against right. The globalists against the nationalists. The coastlanders against the heartlanders, and many other explanations like that. One of our previous speakers here, eminently, speaks of a rich white civil war. Our next speaker here, equally eminent, talks about loneliness as the root problem in the country. But I would argue that if you listen to the deep debates, and as we look at the movements that have flowed through America in the last 50 years, postmodernism, multiculturalism, tribal politics, victim politics, social constructionism, the sexual revolution, and on and on and on. You can see that these ideas have very little to do with 1776 and everything to do with ideas that come from 1789 and its heirs. I don't mean 1789 directly, but I mean the French Enlightenment behind it and descendants of it such as Friedrich Nietzsche or in the 1920s Antonio Gramsci writing from jail in Italy 
More recently, Herbert Marcuse in New York in the 1960s, and even more recently, Michel Foucault. And if we understand the ideas that they've launched into our culture, you can see how many of the movements are closer to that. You just say, say postmodernism, truth is dead, God is dead, all that's left is power, raw, naked power. And you can see in many of the movements, but also in the incidents, the whole notion of resistance, the effects of the Kavanaugh hearing, and one could go on. And I believe that the problem is best understood in the light of seeing the difference between those two views of the American Republic and of freedom in particular. But why is that important? Freedom is central for a very simple reason. As St. Augustine used to say, nations are best understood not by the size of their population or the strength of their army, or we would say today the GNP or the throw weight of the missiles. They're best understood by what he called what a nation loves supremely. And seen that way, there's no question that both for Americans and for outsiders, the central heart of America is freedom, freedom. And you can give a thousand reasons supporting that and very obvious to you who are Americans. But why has that gone so wrong? Marx predicted a proletarian revolution. The haves and the have-nots, a caste conflict. Gramsci, sitting in jail under Mussolini, said Marx was wrong and we need to sharpen the analysis. The problem is not really a conflict of class, but a conflict of culture. And the real revolution would come by winning cultural hegemony, gaining the hearts and minds of the gatekeepers, the ruling class, and then you can control a country. And you can see with the rise of neo-Marxism, cultural Marxism, call it what you like, many terms since Gramsci, since Marcuse, that began to come in powerfully in the 1960s. So in many ways, Martin Luther King was the last to refer to the Declaration as a promissory note. But then you move to Stokely Carmichael, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the rise of second-type feminism, and you see a very different view. And somewhere around 1968, no one can date it exactly, except that was the year when Rudi Deutschke, the leader of the Red Brigade in Germany, called for, in the light of Gramsci and Marcuse, a long march through the institutions. And 50 years later, precisely this year, you can see how much of the colleges and universities, much of the press and media, much of the world of entertainment has actually been won to views that come from that side. Of course, I mentioned the deepest divide since just before the Civil War. And that creates a very obvious difference from where we are today. Because in that time, you had a Lincoln who knew the evils that were facing the country and he'd fought for years against the moral evil of slavery. And yet he fought against it in the light of his belief in the Declaration and he addressed the better angels of the American nature. I was in Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago and reminded of his two speeches there on his way to Washington, elected president. He comes to Philadelphia, neither speech was prepared, rather off the cuff, but he says in both of them that all his ideas came from the document that came from that building, the Declaration. And in one of them, he finishes quoting Psalm 137. The psalm has the lines, may I not forget you, Jerusalem. And he refers that love of the Jews for their city to his love of the Declaration. And he picks up the psalm and he says, may my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I'm unfaithful to the ideas that came from this building. And he even says he hopes to turn the country round. And if he fails and is assassinated, it would be something worth trying. And of course, as we know, it was only a few years later that he was there again 
when his body lay in state in the Philadelphia. If I may say so, with the crisis we've seen growing over the last 30 years, I have rarely ever heard an American leader today addressing the present crises in the light of the founding vision, addressing the better angels of the American nature in the light of liberty and justice for all that comes from the Declaration. In other words, there is at the moment no Lincoln-like vision and courage and leadership. No one will make America great again unless they ask what made it great in the first place and go far deeper than issues such as the economy, such as the military. America is a nation by intention and by ideas. And unless they're restored in their understanding, you can see the inroads of ideas that come from a very different revolution. In other words, America today is at a Rubicon moment. When Caesar stood there in front of that narrow, rushing torrent in northern Italy, the whole of Roman fate stood on the hinge. When he crossed it, as Cicero said, and he was the first to use the word rhino, Cicero said Rome was now a republic in name only. And for better or worse, Augustus Caesar shifted it to the Rome and the empire of the Caesars. America is at that moment. And the question is, will the founding vision, the founding principles, and all that they mean for freedom, will they be restored or will they slowly be replaced as they're eroded? That, I believe, is the issue before the country. And I, going round, call Americans to a national conversation, a national town hall meeting. Which way do you want to go? 1776 restored or 1789, and it says replacing it. A national conversation. Now, I wrote earlier on freedom. But in the debate that followed that, it was quite clear that while Americans were interested in sustainable freedom, many of them never really asked what freedom actually is. So this book is a checklist offered as an admiring visitor, a checklist of questions, 10 of them, for Americans to ask as to how they come out on these basic questions, all of which touch on freedom. First, because you can come out with a deeper understanding of what the framers were trying to do with their flaws, or one comes out dismissing them and going in a very different way. And I would argue that the other way, the other revolution, is disastrous for freedom. And if we look at the major revolutions of the world, the English Revolution, which failed, the American Revolution, which succeeded, and then the three alternatives, the French in 1789, the Russian in 1917 and the Chinese in 1949, which I was privileged as a small boy of 10, to witness. The first two have a very distinctively different view of freedom. In fact, through the Reformation, they go back to the scriptures. Although, as I said, the English Revolution failed, but what was the losing cause in England, or the lost cause, as they put it, became the winning cause in New England. But each of those two, very, very different from the other revolutions, the French, the Russian, and the Chinese. And yet many of the ideas, particularly among the intelligentsia today, many of them unwitting, are closer to the ideas that come from that side rather than from the American. The first question I raise is the one actually I spoke on last year at the Trinity Forum. Where does freedom come from? I put that in only because with the attacks on waspishness in the 60s and now the attacks on white privilege, there's no suggestion in what used to be historical commonplace that much of the New England liberties were the ancient liberties of the English. Only historians would be interested in that today. Ask the average American where freedom comes from and they would say, obviously, Athens, democracy. But it didn't. 
it comes through the Reformation back to Mount Sinai. And I think we need to explore how Sinai and the Exodus and the Covenant made such a difference through the Reformation in shaping the early understanding of this country. Because you have a very, very different view, say, than democracy. Athenian democracy, 50 years and no more. And the framers were extremely wary, above all, of direct democracy, but of democracy at large for various reasons. Whereas covenantalism, constitutionalism, is rich in its implications for citizenship. Second question I raise, what do you Americans mean by freedom? Gertrude Stein said famously, a rose is a rose is a rose. But you can't say freedom is freedom is freedom. It's much subtler and more challenging and complex than that. And you can see that different views of freedom come out in very different places. In the 1850s, Abraham Lincoln said, everyone talks about freedom, but they mean different things in the North and the South. And today, there are other profound differences from that. Lord Acton, the greatest historian of freedom, argued that the basic difference is between those who see freedom as the permission to do what you like and those who see freedom as the power to do what you ought. But there are many other subtleties that come out in our arguments and living lifestyles today. I was saying to March in the discussion earlier, I had the privilege of being at Oxford with Isaiah Berlin, the great Jewish philosopher. And I can still hear his rich, deep voice arguing about the differences between negative freedom and positive freedom. Negative freedom, freedom from. No one's free if they're under the constraint or the coercion of any external person or force, whether it's colonial power or a bully or whether it's drugs or alcohol or pornography. Negative freedom is the beginning of freedom. Freedom from. But that's only the preliminary and only half of freedom. As Isaiah Berlin argued, freedom is negative, freedom from, but it is also positive. It's freedom to be, freedom for. Now, that's more challenging because you need truth. You need to know the truth of who you are in order to be free to be who you are. And, of course, that's where the differences come in. And today, truth itself is thrown out the window in a post-truth world. But full freedom is never negative only. And yet, much of American freedom, much of libertarian freedom is purely negative. Get the government off my bank balance. Get the government off my body, different sides say. But purely a negative freedom. And you can see the problems that grow out of this. Negative freedom is unsustainable and runs into the sands of license and permissiveness and never lasts. Americans really need to look at the challenge of freedom, what it actually means, and how it can be cultivated. The third question is, have Americans really faced up to the paradox of freedom? Sure, all of us in this town have been to the Korean War Memorial. Pondered the words, freedom is not free. They're brief, inspiring, and poignant obviously referring to the last full measure of devotion, as Lincoln called it, for those who gave their lives for the freedom of the country. But the paradox of freedom is much darker than that and not so memorable, but it's simple. The greatest enemy of freedom is freedom. The greatest enemy of freedom is freedom. If you squeeze the whole history of civilizations into one hour, Free societies only come in in the last five minutes. Freedom is rare. Freedom is fleeting. Freedom is very rarely sustained. Sometimes freedom becomes permissiveness, becomes license, becomes anarchy, and rebounds from one side into authoritarianism. Sometimes freedom-loving people so love freedom they want to be safe and secure, and have so much security and surveillance, one nation under surveillance, <laughs> they're not free. Or again, freedom-loving people 
so love freedom, they'll do anything to fight for freedom, including things that contradict freedom. And you could go on down the line and see the ways that freedom undermines itself. Freedom requires some restraint, Edmund Burke. You have to have chains on our appetites and desires. But the trouble is, the only appropriate form for freedom is self-restraint. And yet self-restraint is what's undermined quickly when freedom flourishes. And once again, it becomes license, and we could go on. Or again, the great French theorist Montesquieu pointed out, freedom requires two things, but people only think of one. Freedom requires structures of freedom, the constitution, the law. Now, you can lay those down for decades, if not centuries, but that's only half of freedom. Freedom requires the structures of freedom. Freedom requires the spirit of freedom. And that has to be cultivated in every generation and passed down from generation to generation. And if any fails and you don't have the spirit of freedom, eventually the structures of freedom will mean nothing. But the deepest part of the paradox is actually spiritual and psychological. There is a certain freedom in tyranny and there's a certain tyranny in freedom. Why? Freedom requires responsibility. Free people are responsible, but responsibility is tough, challenging, and demanding, and it's easier to be dependent on others, on the government, on whomever. And you can see again and again that people give over their freedom for entitlement and various other forms of dependency, and freedom goes. In other words, as the rabbis put it simply, liberation is not liberty. Or as they put it otherwise, it took God one day to get Israel out of Egypt. But it took 40 years and counting to get Egypt out of Israel. <laughs> and you can see their grumbling, their desire to go back, their hunger for other gods rather than the Lord. Liberation was one thing, liberty was another. And liberty, rather like the 10,000 hours principle, demands discipline and the long obedience in the same direction. And you can see the paradox, put it simply, America's the land of the free. But looked at from Europe, people say, why do you have more addictions, take the opioid crisis, more recovery groups than any other land in the modern world? You say you're free, but clearly your freedom in area after area has become obsessions and has become addictions, has become bondages. Americans are not as free as they say they are. And one could go on. One of the issues I raise, and some of you know I would do this one, is the whole question of freedom and diversity. I had the privilege of launching my first ideas under the wonderful leadership of Dr. Bruce McClory, who's with us tonight. Religious freedom, freedom of religion and conscience. And I was involved in the Williamsburg Charter and early, later the Global Charter of Conscience in Europe. And in a few weeks, we'll see the American Charter of Freedom of Religion and Conscience launched here at the National Archives. But while with the Williamsburg Charter 30 years ago this year or the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, you had an extraordinary consensus it's sad to say that there's been a bigger sea change on religious freedom in the last 20 years than in all the previous 300 years of America put together. I call them the three dark R's, the reducers. Those who now talk of religious freedom, which James Madison called free exercise, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights describes as the right to adopt and practice and share and change your views. If you start thinking of each of those, incredible implications, Muslim blasphemy, all sorts of things. But now it's reduced to freedom of worship. And even the previous president and one of the secretaries of state for a year talked only of freedom of worship. But any of you who know the world, every self-respecting dictator grants freedom of worship. Whatever you think, between your two ears, so long as your mouth is firmly shut and you stay in your home, we can't freedom of worship. 
That's not what the First Amendment meant. And those who are shrinking in this way are doing so as a monstrous injustice to the greatness of American history. The second dark hour are the removers. Particularly in the light of 9-11, so many of those who were atheists said, now we see the ugly face of religion, we've got to remove it from public life altogether. There had been, even earlier, strict separationists. Some of the ACLU, some of Americans United, and so on. But the American Revolution was very different through the First Amendment from the French Revolution and its laicite. But increasingly, for many people now, freedom has become freedom from religion, not religious freedom as freedom for religion, including atheists. But it's the third dark R that is the really problematic one currently. And I call them the rebranders. Go back to the revolution. Again and again, the framers talk of civil liberty and religious liberty. Twin brothers, hand in hand. Now it's been rebranded from being America's first liberty, which the framers called it, to being a code word for bigotry and discrimination. But the logic of this doesn't just undermine religious freedom, which is bad enough. It undermines the right to dissent, and it undermines the right to conscientious objection. <clears throat> Many profound things are at stake in this new idea. The removers, the reducers, and the rebranders. And in 20 short years, this country, which had a better record than any country in history, on religious freedom is now in the same turmoil that much of the rest of the world is. To me, profoundly sad and sometimes outrageous, whether it's sorrow or anger, at some of the appalling arguments that I see. Where does this leave us? On the one hand, it's pretty hard. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been fighting a chest infection all week. On the one hand, Certain things are obviously required. I would argue we need a leader on the level of a Lincoln with courage, <clears throat> with a sense of historical perspective, who's able to address the current problems which are here, but in the light of the better angels of the American nature. And my wife and I pray daily that God will raise up such a person. At another level, we need a restoration of civic education, of transmission, so that all the first things of the American experiment are alive and vibrant in every generation. Now, of course, you can see how the influence of multiculturalism from 1905, Horace Callan, originally rather despised and attacked by people like John Dewey and Walter Lippmann, didn't really flourish until the 1970s, but then became the reigning ideology. And under its influence and things like tribal politics, civic education went out the window. But then, of course, the public schools, which were not just free universal education, but free universal education that taught the first things of the American experiment no longer did. But in terms of the original motto, a pluribus unum. All you had left was the pluribus and the balkanization, but no unum. The 19th century, it's often pointed out, people who had been given a scrap of paper could write maybe 10 or 12 first principles that all Americans, whatever their background, religious, linguistic, cultural, or whatever, all Americans would agree of. I've actually tested it out with some CEOs today and some college students, and very few, and except in the good colleges, can get much beyond one or two. The unum is no longer there. I've listened to the immigration debate for 30 years. Now people are talking of walls and sanctuary cities. Hardly anyone talks about civic education and what it means for every new generation and every new immigrant to really learn what it is to be American. As Samuel Hunting used to say, it's relatively easy to become an American. 
but increasingly difficult to know what it is to be American. And those first principles are increasingly gone. At a third level altogether, we need a new openness for freedom in public life, whether it's freedom of speech, think of the campuses, or freedom of religion, as I was saying. And without that, the very vitality of freedom will eventually wither. The great scholar Daniel Elazar, who put the notion of covenant and constitution on the map, in one of his later reflections, he pointed out that covenants come from the Middle East and a culture of what he called oases. And then he said, what makes an oasis luxuriant, large, and lasting? One thing only, the wellspring at its heart. And if the wellsprings of faith and freedom go, no talk of freedom and no amount of the Constitution will eventually keep freedom flourishing. So certain things are relatively obvious that need to be done as part of this restoration. But at the same time, if we look at this Rubicon moment in the light of history, you can see the incredible warnings of history. Caesar Augustus thought that he created a permanent republic. Imperial republic there was. That's why Rome has got the title the Eternal City. But was his system eternal? No. We look at the genius of the American founders. They believed across the board that you could create a free society that could stay free forever. Never been done but they believed they had the way. Very few Americans today could even tell you the system they created to keep it sustainable. And while they've neglected it or even attacked it, no one's tried to put something better in its place, which means that freedom is unlikely to last. And the warnings of history with corrupted freedom are sobering. You know the old classical saying, the worst is the corruption of the best. It's a matter of profound soberness to Europeans that it was our best educated, most cultured, most highly civilized country with philosophers like Immanuel Kant and musicians like Beethoven produced the Holocaust. The worst is the corruption of the best. And I would just say to you, there are things happening in your country today which for those who love this country, is this the America we've known? These things are unrecognizable. And we're just seeing the beginning of some of these ideas working out. Any of you know the history of the Peloponnesian War? One of the little side issues is the state of a little city-state on the island of Curfew. Corfu. And you can see that some of the things happening this very decade are the things that happened there. For example, when people didn't accept democratic elections, undermined the legitimacy, and in reaction, people criminalized political differences, and others fought back with fire against fire, and eventually the little city state was reduced to nothing. And you can see how much of our liberal left today are following patterns which have brought destruction on previous countries and civilization. So let me finish with a plea to you, a personal plea. As I said, I'm not American. I love my American wife, and I have a son who is half and half. <laughs> British passport. And and an American passport. So I love this country very deeply. But my concern isn't just for, as it were, for freedom today for you. Yes. But your experiment is of titanic significance in history. This is the longest running public tutorial of freedom in all human history. 
countries and civilizations rise and prosper through the ingenuity of their freedom. And at the same time, countries and civilizations decline and fall through the perversion and corruption of their freedom. And America's facing this question. Will it restore the realism and the balance of the original freedom, understanding the flaws that have to be recognized and addressed? Or will it go another way and destroy that freedom altogether? I have no idea what's going to happen. Such is the very nature of freedom that you can never plumb people's motives for why they act. And the wonderful thing about the biblical view of freedom, which incidentally is unique to Jews and Christians, you don't find freedom in the Egyptians. You don't find freedom in the Babylonians. It was the stars. You don't even find freedom fundamentally in the Greeks. Everything was finally fate. And let me put it very soberly today. You don't find freedom among the secularist philosophers. Spinoza, Marx, Freud, J.B. Watson, B.F. Skinner, Jacques Bonneau, and move right down to the new atheists such as Ham Sam Harris. What is freedom, he says? The very front cover of his book is of a puppet on strings. You cannot use naturalistic science alone to give a grounding for freedom. Freedom is actually unique to the Jewish and Christian scriptures. But freedom being what it is, we can never plumb each other's motives and the best pundits and the cockiest forecasters will never ever be able to close the circle with certainty and say what's going to happen. It depends on us. And I would just say to you, in the light of where we are today, the choice is yours. Will this great American story, this great American journey, this great American quest for a free, just society that can stay free be finished in this generation because people gave up on the founding principles? Or will there be enough who have the courage to explore and stand against it with all the challenges we have in the universities and in many other places today. The choice is yours. And so also will be the consequences. Thank you. Thank you for that, Oz. We will have a brief moderated conversation here before turning it over to the most dynamic part of our evening conversation, which is hearing from the audience. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted just to flesh out a few of the points that you made a little bit more, and wanted to ask you about some of the solutions you proposed, uh, one of which was yearning for a Lincoln-like leader. And of course, some of the challenges that our leaders have now are both structural and technological, and that different things are rewarded now than they were in Lincoln's day. Uh, it's, it's not that uh, politicians no longer give talks about civic education or the better angels of our nature, but more likely, none of them are ever covered. Uh, and what tends to get more attention, to get more likes, to get more press coverage, uh, is that which is either trivial or um, pointed, argumentative, uh, and polarizing. What advice would you have uh, for leaders who wish very much to rally Americans to the better angels of their nature, but also face the very real constraints of needing to raise money, to get attention, and to get elected? No, I understand what you're saying. And obviously, that's why President Trump uses Twitter to leap over the media. And I remember I had the privilege of being in a number of White Houses. I remember once at Camp David, President Clinton saying he loved the State of the Union because that was the only time in the year when he spoke directly to the people not mediated by the media and all the fracturing of opinions and pundits and so on. So I understand all that. But I have to say that while I've heard 
wonderful talks on civic education, education, things like this. I grew up with Churchill. He was seasoned with history. Almost every great speech he gave had a historical perspective to it. And without mentioning names, I can only think of two people in our 30 years here who've had that sense of history as addressing the present problems. It's a rare thing, and I don't think all of them are either interested in it or, or, or capable of it, but we need a leader like that. One of the other uh, antidotes that you suggested was a restoration, uh, both that involves civic education, but also an author you quote uh, repeatedly in your book, although not in your talk, which is Robert Bella, and the habits of the heart. Uh, for, uh, yes, which Bella also quotes and has a, a book title by that name. Uh, which of the habits of the heart do you believe are most important uh, for sustaining freedom? And uh, which would you most recommend to members of our audience who are thinking about practical ways that they can help sustain freedom uh, in their own communities? Uh, I think a whole number of, th the foundations have so deeply gone that I think the habits of the heart have got to go right down to the basics today. Notions such as truth, integrity, what do we mean by words, trust, and then move up to human dignity, freedom, justice, what do these things mean? And really unpack them. They've, many of them become cliches, and many of them become very hollow cliches. Now by the unum, to balance the pluribus, I meant a rather different number of things. The rule of law, freedom of conscience, separation of powers, things like that. Uh, so the habits of the heart should include an appreciation of those, but I'm thinking of things that, that are crucial to independence. Mm -hmm. A free society should be a self-governing society. People don't need the government to tell them everything. Well, responsibility is a very tough notion in today's world, and that's at the heart of the scripture. You know, the Jews actually argue that responsibility or irresponsibility is at the heart of the fall. So, Adam, the woman you gave me, or Cain, am I my brother's keeper? Each of them is a sloughing off of responsibility. So, to bring up children today to be responsible and know what that means, that's one of the habits of the heart. Another one that you mention in the book is the importance of making and keeping promises to freedom. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about why ordinary human commitments are so important to sustaining freedom. Well, if you think families depend on trust, business depends on trust, government depends on trust, and all of them are doing badly. So people make that rather sort of vague, but if you think, um, Shuri, I'll see you at 11 tomorrow. Or you say to me, let's have lunch next Tuesday. If I don't turn up or you don't turn up three times in a row, you're not predictable. You're not trustworthy. And actually, the simplest things in life depend on trust and commitment and keeping promises. Now, that's highly controversial. So Machiavelli threw it out the window. You know, what the prince said yesterday absolutely unbinding in what is this today. Think of politics now and the postmodern world. We again and again here, I'm not going to mention names, but you see people said 20 years ago this, and today something completely different. They just don't keep their word. How can you trust them or well, the very system when they do that? So that's very important. Now Nietzsche was rather more torn. He said, of course he believed in an autonomous individual, he said, the human is an animal entitled to keep promises. Well, the trouble is we don't. Now, that's a very biblical view. The notion of covenant is a promise keeping. But the Lord keeps his word. Humans don't. And that's the problem. That's the weakness with constitutionalism and so on. I, I would argue that you know, even say the kneeling controversy, I don't get too political, but think of the difference in Kaepernick and Martin Luther King. For Martin Luther King, the declaration was a promissory note. So you appealed to the declaration, symbolized by the flag, enshrined in the pledge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas any disrespect to that is actually a disrespect to the promissory note. So I would say, what revolution are they looking to? Not to the American Revolution if you disrespect it. They've misunderstood what it is. We should be challenging them. Yes, there is injustice. The injustice has to be remedied. 
But if you believe in the Declaration, you have, say, Frederick Douglass or Booker T. Washington, they hated slavery and attacked it for all they were worth, but they believed in the Declaration as the standard through which it could be finally remedied. That's the difference to much of the hard left today. But you mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. in the promissory note, and one of the tensions that your book explores is you say at one point a key feature of the difference between these two types of revolutions was the insistence that change takes time and that transformation requires patience. And I believe it was the same speech where Martin Luther King quote, uh, talks about the promissory note that he also talks about the fierce urgency of now and the fact that justice delayed is justice denied. How do you balance those two competing ideas that real change takes time with a recognition that there can be a body count and a, to a lack of justice uh, extended? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the history of revolution, the other three, the French, the Russian, the Chinese, were all utopian. Take Mao, he was a poet. He just had to break a few eggs to make the omelet and that sort of thing. In other words, whenever you have a topian view of the possibility of change, there's a gap between reality and the ideal. And it's always filled with coercion. And it leads to violence. And of course, that's where Martin Luther King was a pacifist. He would not take to violence. And that's the difference between some of those who followed him, who were impatient. You can say, go back in a less controversial thing, say William Wilberforce, and Lloyd Douglas, uh, sorry, William Lloyd Garrison. Wilberforce was attacked as an incrementalist. You had to do it step by step by step because that's change has to take place in the human heart. You can't just change structures. William Lloyd Garrison was sort of all or nothing, the Constitution, a compact with hell and all that. He actually inflamed the South even more by the extremism of his rhetoric. So as soon as people are utopian, got to do it all now, they will eventually take to extremist and then violent means, and that's disastrous. The paradox of freedom that you mentioned is an idea that has been echoed by some in talking about liberalism itself, liberal democracy, uh, that essentially what allows uh, freedom actually contains the seeds of its own destruction. And as you know, there have been increasing number of intellectuals and perhaps particularly conservative intellectuals who have predicted that liberalism uh, and perhaps by extension freedom has already failed. Do you agree with them? No. And <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of some of our friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would say gently, mm -hmm. I come out of the Reformation background. They come out of a different one. And they try and say mm -hmm. that American freedom owes all that to those things back in the medieval world. It didn't. Mm -hmm. You can see that, well, put it like this. When Theodosius declared Rome Christian in 380, officially, it, historians say they copied Greek ideas uncritically and they copied Roman structures uncritically. And the structures were Rome hierarchical, the Caesar and all that. And you had the Pope and all that. Now, Lord Acton, a Catholic, was the one who famously said, all power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and the context of that was a criticism of his own church, because when hierarchical power is corrupted, it becomes very oppressive, the Inquisition, etc. The Reformation, not immediately and not fully consistently abandoned that, went back to the Bible, to Exodus and the Covenant. And you have a very different view of freedom. So if you look at Burke's defense of the American colonists, he called them the dissenters of dissent or the Protestants of Protestantism. And American freedom owes almost everything to the Reformation, not to the medieval church. And that's where I differ from some of those. Now, the biblical view of freedom is tough. You have to follow a way of life to be free. Or Jesus of Nazareth says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So, postmodernism, there is no truth. We would say, well, that sort of a freedom will run to seed and produce chaos. In other words, you've got to follow the truth and a certain way of life to really be free. You know, Lord Moulton, freedom is obedience to the unenforceable. As soon as you need external restraints, you're less free. 
So for the last half hour of our evening conversation, we will turn to the most dynamic part of this yeah. event, which is to hear from you all in the audience. And those of you who have been to a Trinity Forum event before know we have three guidelines for all audience questions, and that we simply ask that all questions be brief, all questions be civil, and all questions be in the form of a question. <laughs> so Don't we have, stand up there uh, you, you can sit, I can sit. Um, that's fine, too. Yeah. We will have two different uh, microphones roving around. Please wait till I have uh, called on you, and if you could just stand, say your name, that would be great. We've got a person right here. If you could stand so it's a little bit easier for our roving microphone deliverer to see you, that would be great. Hi, Carl Golovin. I first was asked to violate all of your rules by laying a foundation for a question. <laughs> May, may I? I'm sorry. <laughs> may I violate all of your rules by laying a foundation for a question? Uh, uh, we would ask that you not. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the, the opioid crisis, and I would ask, in, in the mid-1800s, the British made war upon China to compel China to allow the importation of opium to generate revenue for the crown. and. Um, as a result of winning that war, uh, Hong Kong was obtained as a free port for the next 150 years. And I, I don't know when the British ever renounced the trafficking of opium, but I do know today that US troops guard the poppy fields in Afghanistan. And I think all of this error is traceable back to the corruption of the monetary unit, uh, which you know, the Bank of England, of course, inflated its currency beyond the amount of gold it had to increase economic activity. And our country has now been persuaded to do the same thing through the Federal Reserve, which, which results in dishonest weights and measures. And I would just uh, ask you, I've, I have digressed, uh, that, that, that do we not need an honest unit of account in order to have peace among people and among the nations? Of course. I think the opium war, which as you say was imposed by the British, is one of our major national evils and sins. I'm very grateful to say my uh, grandfather was one of the first surgeons in China, treated the last emperor and so on. My grandfather's sister actually wagged her finger in the face of Queen Victoria and told the queen it was a sin. And I'm proud and grateful to say uh, her brother fought against King Leopold of the Belgian, where you had some of the most horrendous oppressions in European colonialism. So these things, let's make no question, they were evil, and they are scandals and sin, and a real blot on the character of British history. I don't want to make any bones about it. Other questions, right over here, if you could just stand up. Hello, I, I'm Jason Turner. I've noticed that uh, Americans over the past decade or so have increasingly, rather than think of themselves as servants to anything above them, their country, their religion, are increasingly self-confident that their own views um, and their own personality uh, uh, it, it dom dominates external institutions. Can you comment on that? Um, uh, I accept your comment. In other <laughs> words, freedom can very easily become a good or a bad form of autonomy. I said it was obedience to the unenforceable. Those who are truly free are self-governing, but that can easily become an autonomy that becomes arrogant and can, becomes conceited and, and so on. And that's often the overspill. Or you look at it in Western civilization more generally. If you look at the last century, there are the whole different types of humanism. The dominant 18th century secular humanism. God is dead, man has come of age. We're now directing our own evolution. But that failed. <coughs> Think of the book Voltaire's Bastards. How many of the Enlightenment philosophers were racist and their ideas produced modern anti-Semitism, etc., etc. So you got, in the 50s, a reaction against that, which was called post-humanism. That humanism was too male chauvinist, 
was too European, was too whatever, and people reputed it all. And then you had a reaction against that with so-called uh, post-humanism in the direction of the animal world. We are one with animals. And now the future is holding out transhumanism, which is humanism understood in terms of all the enhancements of technology. So humanism itself, in its secular forms, is a very unstable thing, and Christians would understand it. Humans are made free, but we can pervert, corrupt, misuse, abuse our freedom in all sorts of ways, and Americans have certainly done that at times. Look for a question over on this side. Lindsay, if you could just stand up while the microphone comes to you, that'd be great. Your comments, as always, are grave and significant. Thank you. You note with accuracy, I believe, that in the last 30 years, the decline of character in our country and the decline of the ideals of liberty from 1776 has been of this nature. And yet we have an economic engine that has been of this nature. Our stock market is at its highest levels ever. <clears throat> Can you help us understand how that part of our economy seems blind or uncaring of the character and liberty decline to which you speak? Mm -hmm. You could equally say the same about technology as well as economics. In other words, the Enlightenment idea when they rejected God was the economy would flourish and moral progress would flourish, technology would advance and moral progress would advance. But most people would say today that they become untethered. Now, take the economy. Obviously, capitalism is the greatest engine of wealth creation in all history. But what you see in the Bible is that, say, in the covenantal system, you have to reinsert, re-inject notions of justice and equality and liberty every so often. All the differences and inequalities get huger and huger. If you read some of the latest stuff, say, from Silicon Valley or MIT, you know, Max Tedmark's book last year, this year, uh, Life 3.0, he argues that when we're moving to artificial superintelligence, the gaps we think today between the poor, say, and Jeff Bezos, which are pretty significant, or the gaps between workers and CEOs, which in America are out of all proportion to European workers and CEOs, when you move towards artificial superintelligence, it's going to be through the ceiling altogether. In other words, we're going to increase through this incredible progress technologically and economically, increase inequalities, potential injustice, and as soon as you have inequalities, you'll have a swing towards various ways of tackling injustice, like Marx tried, and you'll have a swing towards the left, unless there's a reinsertion, and that's what you see in the Bible. The Sabbath and the seven years and the seven times seven years and so on, you see what it was intended to do in the midst of these things to stop inequalities. And we've got to think through things like that, not in a redistributionist socialist sense, but, but injecting justice and responsibility and generosity back into the system. I, I, can, I don't want to harp on my family, but um, when the founder of our family came to faith, Arthur Guinness, he came to faith through John Wesley, the great Methodist preacher who made such a difference here in the first awakening in America, which was behind the American Revolution. But Wesley's simple principle, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And my ancestors built that into the brewery. And for better or worse, they became Ireland's most generous philanthropist. Until recently, doing it anonymously in biblical ways. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, and so on. Because in the early days, they were deeply committed Christians in doing that. But whatever it is, generosity, we've got to rebalance the system because capitalism is so powerful that if we just let it run away without ethical boundaries, it'll be ruinous to itself. In the back there, standing up. All I can see is a silhouette, I'm afraid, but I'm... Ah, so it's your neighbor, Dennis. Ah, Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> your, your book 
puts great store in the Exodus and Sinai as the very definition or uh, pattern for freedom. What does it do to your argument that most biblical scholars today, most historians, most archaeologists, the great majority of them, view the Exodus as a myth, that it never really happened? Dennis, you and I have had many discussions of good glasses of wine. <laughs> there are certain scholars. And certainly since the 18th century, you can see even in the Christian church and somewhat in Judaism too, revisionist scholarship that's skeptical, undermining the historical reliability and so on. At the same time, I would say today, the best scholarship is actually doing the reverse, showing the reliability, the historicity of the biblical account. Now, my concern has been the implications of it. If it's purely a myth, it has no implications. But I don't think we need to go your way. And I could give you great scholars who have a very different view of it, whether it's the Exodus or whether it's the New Testament or whatever. I think good scholarship today can show you the historicity and reliability of the texts. And that's the sort of thinking. Jenny and I happened to have the privilege of being at uh, Oxford. Uh, my fellow student was N.T. Wright. We know him as Tom Wright. He is maybe the premier scholar in the world on first century in terms of the texts of the Bible, not the Exodus, as you say. And he's shown that these things can be trusted. And the point is that someone who has a living, examined faith wants a basis in evidence and in truth and in convictions because we are staking our entire existence on that. And I've been a follower of Jesus for more than 50 years. I've grown up in the East with a Buddhist culture, been back to China many times with its secular culture. I studied under a guru. I've known many of the great atheists of this world, including Madeleine Murray O'Hare and Bertrand Russell. But the deeper I go, the more convinced I am, not only of the truth of the Christian faith, but of the profound adequacy when you look at the way its deep foundational principles make all the difference where we are today. So I think we could give you stuff to show you that Exodus or the Gospels can be really understood after investigation as solidly reliable. But you're right, that's a key question. There was a question in the back row there. Thank you, Oz, for an absolutely fantastic presentation. I've been uh, attending Trinity Forum for about 25 years, and uh, I'm always bowled over by your comments. Um, I'd like to just give one small suggestion for actualizing some of the brilliant ideas that you have t demonstrated today, and that is that if every liberal asked a conservative for dinner one night, and perhaps following your you notion. Cannibal style? <laughs> <laughs> With fava beans. Um, and had perhaps a religious intermediary to um, just be there to moderate. Um, that would go a long way to bringing the country together and healing. What do you think of that idea? Terrific. Now, in other words, all of us are small people. And we start with our families and our neighbors and our communities and places we work. But at the end of the day, most of us, some of us here are extraordinarily powerful people, influential, most of us are small people. And all we're responsible for is to be the people we should be among the people that we meet. And so, you know, I'm a writer, so books occasionally, even in this internet age, are read by some people. But we're all responsible for our worlds. And if you think of your world and whether you're standing for whatever it is you want to stand, intelligently and thoughtfully and so on. Now, with many people who are hostile and indifferent, and this is a matter of persuasion, the first task is not to so be so explicit out of, say, being faithful. I believe this and I've got to make you understand I'm... No, it's to raise questions. Because ideas that are not good or ideas that are not true at the end of the day have problems in it. And as you push people to be true to what they say and they believe and they have problems, 
their heads hit the wall and they start to rethink. And you can think today in our culture, for instance, you read Camille Paglia arguing against some of the crazies in the later wave feminists. They're fighting among themselves because you can see the implications of some of these things. So some of the extremes of the transgender world are producing a psychological confusion and many other things, which will be a harvest in the future. But by raising questions, is this what you believe? And what if about that? And so on. So become great question askers. That was the subversiveness of Socrates. And of course, that's the subversiveness of Jesus. When he was asked tricky questions, he asked far trickier ones back. <laughs> and we should be question askers, not just out of a fear of saying what we believe, no by probing people's ideas so they see the problems in what they're advocating. But yes, we're all responsible only in the circles that we move in. And your idea is a great one. Uh, right there, Jeannie Dominic. If you could stand so the microphone, I think I can see you. In other words, that means, say, with the social media, we respect truth, we respect people, we never descend to the name calling, for example. One of the toughest things Jesus of Nazareth ever said was love your enemies. Do that in the present day climate is tough. We've got to do that. Okay, hi. I um, really appreciated your comment about how we need to be free to do what we ought. It's a motto of Charlotte uh, Mason, who I really admired. And I just wonder how you think the education system in the US can contribute to that. I think it's kind of left that um, undone. And what, what are your thoughts about how our public education mm -hmm. system can contribute? I don't want to stray too far in that world. It's not a world that I'm an expert in in any way. I'm incredibly grateful I went to an English school which taught me all those things, to think, to write, to appreciate the classics, to know Greek and Roman history and things like that. You know, when I was a boy, a teenager, British Empire was in its last gasp, but one of the things that was just common to us where I was, we read five newspapers a day, because we were interested in what was happening in Africa, what was happening in Malaysia, wherever it was. It was just part of the way I was brought up. I thought it was natural. Now with the social media, I don't want to speak on the younger generation, but the social media and the internet, many people don't read books, which are the great repository of wisdom. But I, I, I was earlier referring to the public schools and that very significant role they had in passing on the American unum. That's all I was referring to. But I equally know that public education in this country is the graveyard of many an idealist, so I'm not gonna wander into that one. <laughs> we will take two more questions. Um, so, John Gardner, if you could stand. Thank you. Um, as you have said, postmodernists deny the possibility of truth. So a bit of a follow-up to the earlier question, what suggestions do you have for having this national conversation if it seems that there is disagreement about first principles, such as whether there is truth and thus what is a desirable outcome? Truth and ethics are both controversial, but they're both absolutely irrepressible. You cannot think and argue for very long without truth. A great discipline like journalism, remove truth, it's just a rumor mill. Or something like science just collapses without truth, whether notions of whether the scientific investigation is touching a real world, take the difference between the West and Hinduism over reality or peer review. Many of the things that are absolutely critical to our world assume and require truth. So we needn't be embarrassed at all. Even people who deny truth will sooner or later talk in ways that express truth. You can't get away from truth, nor can you get away from ethics and morality. Someone is gonna say you ought, you shouldn't, whatever, within seconds. Now the question is what's the grounding of what they're saying and the different views of that, that's the real issue today. But I'm not the slightest bit worried that truth itself will disappear. No one is hurt by postmodernism more than the postmodernist. 
Everything is then power. And that's incredibly... I, in an earlier book, I told the story of Picasso. Picasso, genius of an artist, monster of a man. One mistress said he would rape us and then paint. He was a devouring ego. Even Alberto Giacometti, his friend, called him the monster. And Picasso predicted that when he died, lots of those around him would go down, as it were, with the Titanic. And certainly several of them committed suicide after he left. Well, if you look at the terrible story of all that, his relationships, there was one person who survived him well. One of his mistresses, Francois Gillot, 40 years younger than Pablo, but she says, every day living with Pablo, I had to put on, like Joan of Arc, the armor of truth. If you have truth, not just power, you can't be manipulated. One word of truth, Solzhenitsyn says, outweighs the entire world. So I have no fear, but we who are people of the book, Jews and Christians, we have a solid view of truth. And so against all the dangers of our postmodern world, we will not be manipulated. We will not give in to power or whatever. Truth addresses power. And without it, we're in the world where might makes right rather than the other way around. But at the end of the day, no one can finally live without either truth or moral values. It's literally impossible. Truth is written into the universe. And moral intuitions are written into our hearts. So our last question of the evening. I know many hands are up. We'll go right over here. <laughs> uh, Dennis Kelly, you mentioned that um, the structural part of our society and the spiritual part of our society, and I think the spiritual part is sometimes hard to debate or hard to discuss. And when I think of Galatians, I think of the acts of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. Self-control is one of those fruits. Can you give me a couple of examples in the Constitution where our framers you know, gave us a structure to rely on that, the obedience of the unenforceable, which is certainly comes out of those spirits? Well, in the chapter on this book on sustainable freedom and in my earlier book of Free People's Suicide, how did the framers think you could create a free society that could stay free forever. In other words, the revolution won freedom. The Constitution ordered freedom. The French won it, the Russians run it, the Chinese won it. None of them ordered it. Their revolution spiraled down to demonic disorder. The third part's the real chunk. How do you keep it, sustain it? Ben Franklin, Republic, Madam, if you can keep it. Now, Tocqueville calls their system the habits of the heart. His mentor was Montesquieu, who talked about structures and spirit. Not spiritual, spirit, a commitment to freedom. The framers didn't give a word for their system. So my word was the golden triangle of freedom. And you can see right across the board whether George Mason, fully orthodox Anglican believer, or say... Uh, ben Franklin and so on. At the other side, they all believed in these things. And there's a trio. Freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith of some sort. And faith of any sort requires freedom. Now, rather like the recycling triangle, it goes round and round and round. Freedom requires virtue, which requires faith, which requires freedom, which requires virtue, etc. Now, you can unpack each of those. Only a virtuous people, John Adams says, are capable of freedom. Now, by virtue, today that's become goody-goody. Whereas for them, it included honesty, loyalty, patriotism, and above all, character. A person who had become a person of integrity because of those values. Character. So there's a fast... I haven't got it in front of me, but John Adams... He loves words like inalienable, indefeasible, inviolable. But there's one sentence where he puts them all together. And you read it and you think, is he moving up to freedom, rights? No. He's talking about the indefeasible, inviolable, whatever, right of the people to know the character of their leader. Now, if you think, character is the bridge between followers and leaders. Followers will never know why a leader's making his or her decisions. If they can trust the character, they trust the leader in the dark. Equally, though, some leaders are so powerful, virtually nothing restrains them, except 
character. And if you look at the history of American presidents, character is often the crucial flaw. Take the Nixon presidency with Nixon's insecurity, Henry Kissinger's paranoia, whatever. You start to see the problems that grew. It's always coming out of character. Now, that's rejected totally today. You remember in the Clinton impeachment, there was a famous letter in the New York Times by various scholars saying, character doesn't matter. For the modern president, what matters is competence, not character. Well, not for the framers. And you see, if you undermine, well, of course, not only virtue is undermined, uh, freedom of religion is undermined too, and so, so is faith. So each of the legs of the triangle, the framers stressed, are all undermined today. And not surprisingly, you haven't got a sustainable freedom. In other words, some things have a kind of mathematical certainty, rather like the sinking of the Titanic. Move this, change that. You can't hope that things will go on the same. They won't. And that's the problem. This is a system set up a certain way. Jonathan Haidt wrote a brilliant article on um, cosmology and the fact of the constants in the universe that would have to be exactly the way they are for our universe to flourish. And he said America's like that. Then he didn't go on to say what those things were. And I think we can do that. That's what I meant by the first principles in the unum. And they've got to be unpacked today. They're ama I'm a huge admirer of the real thing. Now, of course, what I didn't stress tonight, and it was behind everything I said, the Declaration did give that liberty and justice. The Constitution enshrined the three-fifths laws. In other words, you had an evil and a hypocrisy. Samuel Johnson said it immediately. I can't remember the exact quote. Why do those who are yelping about freedom are the drivers of slaves? They immediately saw the Constitution at that point was a hypocrisy and an evil and a contradiction of the Declaration. That's what Lincoln had to tackle. That's what Martin Luther King tackled. But he still believed in the Declaration, whereas today they don't. Somewhere around 1968, there was a fateful lurch left. And from then on, America's been chronically sexist, racist, militarist, hegemonic and all sorts of other nasty things, they no longer believe in the American experiment as the founders set it up. And to me, it's not only a tragedy for you today, it's a tragedy for human history because of the daring and the uniqueness of what was attempted here, never pulled off anywhere else, and now looks as if you're giving it up, unless. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Oz. Uh, copies of Last Call for Liberty are available for sale right over there in the corner. There will be an opportunity to get your book signed right here after you've purchased a copy. For, they're available for $27 right over in the corner. We encourage you to avail yourself of that opportunity. Uh, I saw that there are a lot of hands up towards the end. If you didn't get your question answered, Great to just dive right into the book, so we commend that to you. We also commend an invitation that should be on each of your seats, which is to join the Trinity Forum Society. Uh, as you, if this is your first time, uh, welcome. If you've been here repeatedly, you'll know that part of our aim and our hope is to make possible discussions like the one that you've experienced tonight. Uh, that in a culture that is increasingly characterized by triviality, by distraction, by incivility, polarization, and alienation, we try to offer exactly the opposite, which is a space to grapple with the big questions of life in a focused way that is both intellectually rigorous and warmly hospitable. And we invite you to join with us in doing that. And a vital way of doing that is joining the Trinity Forum Society. Of course, there are many benefits of being a Trinity Forum Society member, and perhaps one of the most important tonight is that everyone who joins the Trinity Forum Society tonight, or I should say the first 10 people who join it tonight, will get a pre-signed copy of Oz's book, so you will not have to wait in the invariably long line. Just go right over there, join the Trinity Forum Society, get your free signed copy. 
Uh, there are many other benefits as well, including our quarterly readings. Uh, many of you will be familiar with our readings. Our latest is Brave New World that we put out uh, every season that draws upon a classic piece of literature or letters, explains its relevance, its enduring significance, and essentially tries to introduce busy leaders to the best of literature and letters out there. If you sign up now, uh, you'll receive not only our fall reading, but also uh, our upcoming Christmas reading, which we're quite excited about, which features excerpts from Dorothy Day's The Long Loneliness with an introduction by David Brooks and Ann Snyder Brooks. So you'll want to sign up to receive that. In addition, you'll get our monthly podcast and our daily list of what we're reading, curated reading recommendations, and help support the, uh, the publications and programs of the forum. If you want to join, uh, if I could just ask my colleagues to stand up and wave. Uh, you can see Alyssa over there. Colleen, if you could stand and wave. And I think Becca Noyes is around here somewhere. There she is. All of them can help you and would be very glad to do so. In addition, if you simply go to the book table in the corner, uh, you can sign up there as well. If you'd like to share uh, this event with others, please do so. We will have video up on our website in the next couple of days at www.ttf.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. Uh, and of course, there'll be plenty of pictures on Facebook. In addition, as a parting gift to you, uh, one of the things that Oz had mentioned was that he was one of the draft, well, he was the drafter of the Williamsburg Charter, which is perhaps uh, one of the best articulations of the uh, history, nature, content, and need for religious freedom. We'd like to offer all of you a free copy of the Williamsburg Charter, which again is available at the book table. We also hope that you will join us for future evening conversations and other uh, Trinity Forum programs. And in fact, in this very room, in just a little over three weeks, on November 26th, uh, we're delighted to be hosting Senator Ben Sass and Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission leader Russell Moore for our discussion of the lonely American, a rootedness and resilience in our riven land, and hope that you will join us for that coming up soon. Uh, even sooner than that, on November 19th, we will be hosting a reading group, well, which together will tackle Brave New World, which will be held on the conference room in our office. Uh, you can also sign up for that. It is free, but registration is required. Finally, as we wrap up this evening, it's always appropriate to end with thanks. And a gathering like this does never occurs without plenty of people doing a great deal of work who deserve our gratitude and thankfulness. Uh, I'd like to thank our volunteers who helped out this evening, Sarah Ray, Amanda Kuwak, Tim Crowbath, Matthew McKnight from the Falls Church Fellows. I'd like to thank uh, Seamus Merrigan, who works with Oz, who put in a lot of effort behind the scenes our incredible Cracker Jack photographer, Clay Blackmore, who's around here somewhere, my fantastic colleagues who do so much work uh, behind the scenes, uh, Colleen Horrocks there, uh, Becca Noyes, and Alyssa Crobath. So if you could just wave your arms again so people can see you, that would be terrific. <laughs> Thank you again to Oz for your thoughtful remarks, as well as to each of you for your participation and presence this evening. We've been so glad to have you here. Thank you and good night.